97 97.5% of the, of the history of the island, okay? <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna pick it up. You saw the, the continents moving around, there's plates shifting. I'm gonna take us back to about uh, half a billion years ago uh, to when North America, the North American plate, and it's a full lecture in itself, uh, was floating around here in the in uh, about south of the equator. Uh, it really just looked like Canada, not much more than Canada was in this plate. And uh, everything was floating around as it had been going on ever since plates were solidified out of the magma ocean. Uh, about 400 million years ago, uh, we had North America collide with Baltica, another little continental plate, and Siberia, another little continental plate. And then the two of them were uh, headed for a collision with Gwanda. Uh, Gwanda, I can never say it right, uh, but it's a, it was a big continent, essentially was Africa and South America. Okay? So they were on a collision course. And again, we're well south of the equator at this time. Uh, and the interesting thing to me is the crust underneath us today, here on Amelia Island, was actually on what's now Africa, the African plate. But uh, we'll see what happens. So uh, Africa then and South America come in and collide. Again, Amelia Island is there in Africa. Uh, Miami was just a little bit south of us and west of us, believe it or not. Uh, and then finally, the two continental plates totally smashed into each other about 300 million years ago. And when two continental plates crash, there's no, no giving, nothing gives away. When a, con when a continental plate and an oceanic plate, the oceanic plate's deeper, stronger, not stronger, but the more dense, it dives under. But when two continental plates collide, bang, big bang. So what happens is you form a mountain range, a huge mountain range. And so after this collision, the crust we're standing on, or the crust underneath us, was high in the mountains, this mountain range. Uh, the Appalachian mountain range, the old Appalachian range, mountain range. Uh, let's see, I've got some pictures here. I mentioned the two, two continental plates colliding, this former huge mountain range. It's going on today. Anyone know where? You know, wanna help me here? <laughs> It's where the Indian plate is crashing in to the Asian plate and forming the Amalias as we speak. That's the kind of mountain range that was over top of us way back when. Uh, and that, that collision in, in, uh, between India and Asia has been going on for about 50 million years. Uh, our collision took place about 300 million years ago. And uh, one of the things it did is it created a lot of granite. These mountain building processes create granite. And it also probably formed titanium oxide, which is kind of interesting. But anyways, of course, then out of the granite comes our quartz and our feldspar. And you can guess where that's leading us. Um, again, about 250, 270 million years ago, we're in the middle of this huge mountain range in the middle of one heck of a hot, dry continent uh, that uh, was right on the equator at that time and uh, probably wasn't a very pleasant place to be, pretty far inland. But then these, these currents that drive all this plate tectonics, here's a, at the height of its glory, Pangaea, have Amelia here, and not too far away is the car, Senegal, in Africa at least on the plate that we're talking about. So as I mentioned, all this heat that comes out of the center of the earth drives all this plate movement. These, this molten material or semi-molten material gets driven by currents, just like heat currents in the air. And eventually, the continent broke apart. This giant um, Pangaea continent. And when it did, our, our, our plate, our part of the plate, 
uh, got stuck to North America. It left Africa and South America and started drifting away from those two um, as part of the North American plate. And it stayed that way ever since. This spreading uh, between the, these continental plates continues on, continues on to this day. If you want to see an active rendition of it, you have to go to Iceland. The rest of it's taking place in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I've been, it's been described as being growing in about a, or growing apart is about the way your fingernails grow, that kind of a rate. And essentially magma is coming up, creating new um, plate and driving the continents apart. Um, as, as this all happens, that island, or that uh, mountain chain that formed over top of us starts deteriorating, starts breaking up. Whether it gets weathered, the granite is broken up into its component pieces of, of silicon dioxide and feldspar. And so we're creating a lot of sand as we break uh, the continents apart. This is, uh, I've got to check my, about, about 100 million years ago, uh, we're finally on the coast. The mountains have been totally torn down by this time. And uh, we're underwater, or here, well, I guess we're on the coast. Colorado is all underwater. And so is most of Wyoming. <clears throat> Uh, because the water levels were higher back then, things were a little warmer, and uh, so anyways, all this material, this mountain range that got broken up and torn up and, and uh, washed down into the sea, formed a nice shelf all the way out to where the Bahamas are, on top of this spreading uh, oceanic crust. a little longer we're underwater again as well as all Florida we're still underwater 60 million years ago and uh, finally we're starting to starting to see the light we're starting to come above above water and eventually we get to the two million years ago not quite two million years ago with the start of the ice age the Pleistocene and um, it's a pretty good rendition. Parts of Canada were covered with a mile of ice. And uh, that, of course, well, opposite of what we're seeing today. The waters all got sucked into making ice for Canada and Siberia. And so there wasn't much uh, land, uh, water left for the oceans, or as much, I should say. By this point, we had everything in, in place for the creation of a barrier island. We had plenty of sediment. We had an ice, um, and it kept arriving. And sediment including muds and sand, and mud is a technical geomorphic term for for uh, silt and clays. And we had plenty of sand available, and it was arriving daily. We had a medium to small tidal range, which is important for creating a barrier island. We had a flat slope adjacent to us out to the sea because of all the sediment that had washed off the mountain ranges and covered the receding uh, continental plate or uh, oceanic plate. There's only one thing missing. We lacked a stable ocean level. And because uh, the earth kept in this last two million years cooling and warming, cooling and warming. Matter of fact, some, some experts claim there have been at least 10 advances and retreats of the Ice Age in the last two million years, although um, it's hard to recognize more than four uh, with, with good proof. So this is what our shoreline has looked like over the years. Uh, you can see that about 130,000 130, years ago, the coast was actually past Yulee, probably out near Hilliard, because the water levels are very high. And that's important because when that happened, another barrier island set itself up right about here. 
And uh, so then it started to cool again. And indeed, the ocean waters retreated. And we went all the way out to that dashed yellow line. So at that point, good old Fernandina was inland by about 80 miles or so wow. as the water level dropped about 180, or excuse me, 390 meters. So uh, these are the temperature changes over the years. And what happened about 18,000 years ago is that the earth started warming up. It had been pretty cold for uh, 100,000 years and it started to warm up. And that island, or that island that had been left here during the previous high stand, <coughs> kind of matured and grew trees and became further and further inland. Um, and uh, the um, well, this is this is the formation of the of the Barrier Island itself back 130 million years, 130,000 years ago. And behind, just like today, behind the Barrier Island we developed a marsh because the muds couldn't get out to the ocean, couldn't settle out in the ocean, and so they all settled out in the back quieter waters while the sands all got moved further along by the river currents and the tides. Again, got ahead of myself here. So then, as I mentioned, everything got warm again warmed up rather rapidly over the last 18,000 years. And we started to see this sand dune develop out in the ocean, this, this uh, barrier reef, if you will, marching toward that old barrier reef. And it started out about four or five miles out, and uh, it quickly advanced, uh, and it trapped between the old island, the old sandbar, and this new bar, it trapped the sediments uh, and formed a mark on the two of them. And slowly but surely, that, that new barrier island marched toward the land as with sea level rising, barrier <coughs> islands move inland. Okay? And that's what exactly happened to, to our barrier island here. And the marsh was trapped between it and the Pleistocene lowland that had developed when the sea levels retreated. And then kept on marching as sea levels continued to rise and finally merged on the south end of the island and left a rather large marsh in between, which we call Wiggins Creek today. So, um, the whole mess is continuing to go inland as sea levels have started to rise again, thanks to I don't know who, but uh, nevertheless, uh, this is how the island formed. Uh, and, again, and again, the creek was a, Higgins Creek was a legacy of this whole process. <clears throat> so can we see this play out on the island itself today? And I've taken some cross sections across the island using Google Earth as my source. And you can see that this is the new dune, the new barrier island that marched this way and combined with us with the older island. And it's rather jagged and not too wide apart, but it's the thing we know is a beach. Some of you live there, I'm sure. The beachfront property is on this part of the barrier. Uh, behind it is the old island, the old Pleistocene sand dune. Uh, a little more mature, uh, been weathered a lot over the 130,000 years that it was above, above land. And so it's uh, a little smoother and a little more stable, if you will. Because it's been here for a while, had trees growing on it a lot longer and the like. And so it's got better soil development and everything else compared to this very young piece of sand that just arrived recently. Uh, and if we look at that, that cross section was down at, uh, in the middle of the plantation about where uh, 
in the St. Louis front uh, the uh, veranda is located. And this is what it looks like uh, today. That's our, our sandbar that marched in on us over the last uh, 18,000 years. Unfortunately, I haven't figured out how to make Google Earth turn my maps north and south. So now you gotta look at the island from the north and uh, you'll see that uh, this is down near Osprey Village and Little Nana and Big Nana Dunes down in American Beach. And again, you can see our Holocene Dune, our new dune uh, cropping up here, pretty ragged, pretty, uh, pretty young, if you will, pretty edgy. Uh, and the old Pleistocene Dune behind it, again, pretty well established, pretty mature. And of course, behind it is the marsh. Um, then we go up to uh, about where Access 40 is to the beach and Crane Island and across the airport. And we get to see, we see the same process. The new dune, the gap, which was a wetland or a marsh in the middle, and then the old place is seen dune, and then the current um, marsh behind it. Uh, there's a place in Dune. I showed Crane Island on this one. One of the things that I have uh, developed here is I show the nine foot elevation. Anyone want to guess why nine foot is an important elevation for us? Mean high tide. Pardon me? Mean high tide every year. No, not quite. Not quite. Not that bad. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. But it's, you're close. You're on the right, right product. That is the 100 year flood level, okay? The, not the flood level necessarily, exactly, but the swell, the still water elevation level that we expect to have happen to us at least once every 100 years. It's been 120, 125 since we've gone through it, but that's the expectation, okay? At least by the experts studying it. So as you can see here, uh, that swell line pretty well swamps uh, some of our properties, unfortunately. I won't mention any names. Um, okay. So this is kind of a caricature of, of what this Holocene dune looks like. In, you know, as a, a generalization. You got the kind of gradual slope down to the beach. And that's one we've historically worried about because that's the one that provides the most protection for people's homes. That's the one we've got to cross to get to the beach. That's the one that we call the dunes. But indeed, everything behind it, and this is not the scale, everything behind it, typically two thirds to three quarters of the dune is behind it. And it uh, grows much taller in many cases. And as <coughs> I'd like to convince you, is just as important in a lot of ways as the front dune. Okay. And again, what we what we see is very steep backs to the to that back part of the dune, because typically we have these trees form up on the edge of it. Uh, you've seen them; they're they're pre-tortured by the salt spray and the wind, but they're hanging in there and do a great job of making sure no sand gets beyond them. They slow the wind down enough. That the sand cannot penetrate any further inland, and neither can salt air. I shouldn't say neither. Salt air also has trouble getting past them. So uh, going a little further north, um, this is another interesting area I wanted to talk about. This is up near uh, Access 6 north, up north of Atlantic Avenue, going across the uh, island uh, and ending up in the port. And again, we're looking south here. Uh, and we've got the, the Holocene dune form here. And of course, here, you know, Higgins Creek is quite wide. We've got a lot more marsh left over there. And then we go over the Pleistocene dune. This must have been where the big elevations were. This is where the, the uh, lighthouse got installed and a bunch of other uh, elevation 
originally must have been the heart of the island, if you will. Still probably is. Uh, but what's interesting is that uh, in front of the Holocene dune, we have what I call the post jetty dune. And I'll explain that in a second. Um, it's the actual dune, the actual island that came ashore, uh, rests up against the state park and is that high dune behind everything. Everything else has been created in the last 150 years. So it is extremely new territory. Um, and this is a blow up of it. Again, this is at the very far end of the city of Fernandina Beach up against the state park boundary. And uh, you can see our Holocene dune over there against the park. Nice high dune, protective. And then this sort of series of dune ridges that grew up after they put in the jetty. And then in front of that is what we commonly call the dune, uh, is uh, essentially a rock revetment built by the Corps of Engineers after um, Hurricane Dora hit in 1964, and then some, some dune that's developed in front of it. Now the big problem with this area is, of course, when I draw in my swell line, the entire area is underwater. So, <clears throat> to recap, uh, we were once part of the African plate, so our sand is all African sand. Come on. Um, we used to be the site of a huge mountain range during the formation of Pangaea. When Pangaea broke, we left Africa and joined North America. Uh, the mountains eroded quickly. Now, when I say quickly, remember I'm talking as a geomorphologist. Quickly in geomorphology terms is millions of years. So um, it uh, took a while, but by geologic standards, very quick. Uh, to fill in the eastern edge of a widening, excuse me, western edge of a widening Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we probably got some titanium oxide. Uh, just bring that up because titanium oxide has come up in the recent discussions. And indeed, the black sand on our beach, I'm pretty sure, is titanium oxide. And uh, it has some value, and at one time we almost mined it here on the island, which would have been a real disaster. Okay, uh, they did mine it down in Point of Vedra, and uh, they're paying for it since. Anyways, um, this is my class. Where is it? This is my classic quote, especially for. Commissioner, uh, then this is uh, oh, what happened. Amelia Island, to summarize it, Amelia Island is typical of a barrier inlet system that consists of littorially derived, reworked riverines, classic sediments with varying amounts of bioclastic locally derived material. I just threw that in there. This means that we were mainly, mainly crushed granite uh, is our sand that was washed down from mountains, reworked by the waves, and augmented with some dead shell material from, from bivalves that are able to take <coughs> carbon, uh, carbon dioxide <coughs> and calcium and form their shells at the outlast step. But I threw that up there so that, you know, I could convince you that us geomorphologists can throw up a bunch of gobbledygook just like doctors and lawyers and Indian chiefs <laughs> to make us sound more important uh, than we really are, okay? So uh, anyways, but that does describe it if you can break it down. Okay, um, so the bottom line is, what am I doing for time? Not good. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, we, we actually have two and a half dune systems here on the island. We got the older one, the Pleistocene Dune, uh, which I live on. I'm not sure how many of you live on which, but if you're sort of east of the lowlands, or excuse me, west of the lowlands, and on uh, east of the marsh, you're probably in the in the Pleistocene Dune area. And it's about 130,000 years old, and it's well established. 
And all it needs is a nice tree canopy, uh, no building in the wetlands, and adequate infiltration capacity, and this could do just fine. And that's really easy, right, Margaret, to get all that stuff? <laughs> I thought so. Uh, so I'm not worried about that building. What is the infiltration? I'll let Margaret worry about it. Infiltration of what? The one I'm worried about is the Holocene dune. It's younger dune. It's young. It's immature. It's got unstable slopes. They're too steep. Uh, it, it needs very heavily vegetated cover uh, to protect from being washed away or blown away at any time. It just doesn't have enough soil development. And it's, unfortunately, it's the primary protection we have for the island from waves. And since the barrier island protects the mainland, it's also the, the thing we're dependent on to protect Yuli and and Callahan, or where else? Um, and it also helps protect our groundwater from saltwater intrusion and uh, from the air, as I mentioned earlier, from getting too far inland with high velocities and with uh, carrying a lot of salt spray and salt that damages plants. And then we have a third one. This is kind of a, like I say, it's about two and a half dunes we have. The North End Revetment Dune System, which again is in front of and separate from the Holocene Dune. And uh, it uh, developed after the jetty was built, about 1881. And essentially what happened is the jetty trapped the sediments that tried to flow into the inlet trapped them, slowed them down, and they settled out and formed little dunes. Uh, after Dora, this rock jetty was built by the Corps of Engineers because uh, the houses on the, on the other side of, of uh, Atlanta, uh, Ocean Avenue uh, were washed away uh, by, by that storm because they really weren't on much elevation, had very little to protect them. Um, the jetty was built to try to protect it. It, if we had another storm like Dora, uh, we probably would have lost, lost the left side of, of uh, Ocean Avenue also. Uh, elevation differences, one of the other problems with this dune, is elevation differences make it very hard to get to the beach over the, over the dune, revetment <laughs> without damaging the dune and the revetment. So it's a real challenge. Because that's where we really need a lot of dune protection that has never been there, and we have to develop if we can 